it's time for the Property Podcast, where every week, tens of thousands of property investors, new and experienced, join together to get news, knowledge, and laughs at our expense. With me, Rob Bentz. And me, Rob Dix. Join us every Thursday morning for your weekly dose of property ideas and motivation. Then head over to our website at thepropertypodcast.com to keep the conversation going. Now though, let's get started. Hello everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever time you're listening to this. Thank you and welcome to the Property Podcast. It's episode 76. I'm Rob B. With me is Rob D. Good day, Rob. How are you? I am very well indeed, thank you. And I'm looking forward to this week's episode, episode 76, like you said, and we're still finding topics, major topics that we haven't touched on yet. This week, how to flip a property. We're talking buy to sell, something a lot of people are thinking about at the moment. We're going to talk you through the opportunities, the risks, and how to go about doing it. And as well as that, we've got a news story and we've got a resource that I've just started using this week and I'm already finding really useful. So all of that coming up. Absolutely. And this week, we won't be starting with our reviews because we've moved them to the end of the show. So from now on, if you want to listen to the reviews that come in, listen at the end and we'll run through them. But to everybody who does enjoy the show, if you're enjoying it, the way to say thanks is a review. And I know many, many of you have already, over 200 in fact. So thank you so, so much for everyone who's left reviews so far. We read every single one, good and bad, and you'll hear that at the end. Okay, so this week, you're listening to this on the first day, if you're listening to the day it's come out. Last night we had the meetup, but obviously we haven't had the meetup yet. It's that weird time thing that happens where we're back to the future s type stuff going on but anyway we record this a week in advance so wednesday has just passed the property meetup has just happened and we're hoping rob it was a success and people turned up <laughs> <laughs> yeah we we are um we'll see on next week's episode if we have to apologize for anything or talk about what a raring success it was we'll we'll find out in next week's episode but yeah we're in limbo this week So, instead of talking about that, let's get a listener on the show, shall we? We've got a voicemail that's come in from Stuart. Hi there, my name's Stuart, I'm from Orpington, and I'm looking at starting buy to let, or maybe buy to sell if it uh, could be done quickly with a friend who's a builder. And I saw your podcast a couple of days ago, I'm already up to number 14, because they're very interesting. And just one thing that I didn't see on there was about buying below market value. It seemed more that maybe you don't go for that, or um, maybe you do, but I just wanted some more information. You said about buying through right move and how to check out properties. Uh, is there a way of searching for properties that they're doing up on right move, or is there a, you also mentioned about using a property finder. Are there any that you recommend? especially this area southeast, um, like Kent. So I uh, wonder if you could uh, maybe enlighten me a bit more. Thanks very much, and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks. Well, thank you, Stuart. And remember, if anybody else wants to leave a speak pipe review, you can just go to propertyhub.net, follow the link, super simple to do, just talk into your computer, and you can leave a review too. But Stuart covered a few things there, Rob. He covered buy to let, buy to sell, and buy below market value. Well, buy to let, we've covered extensively since the episode Stuart's listened to. So we've covered many, many more episodes since, and we've covered buy to let several times. Buying below market value, we've covered two, and there's actually a course that you can access for free in the propertyhub.net. We'll link to it in the show notes, but if you go to this week's show notes, which is the propertyhub.net forward slash flip, that's forward slash flip, nice and easy this week, you can find all the links we're talking about. But the one we haven't done, Rob, is buy to sell. And that's what we're covering today. Yeah. So a timely message. Thank you very much, Stuart. I hope you get what you want to out of today's episode. And I'm sure it's something we'll come back to in the future as well. Now, though, let's move on to our news story this week. And this is one that I picked out because I thought it's one of those things that sounds really counterintuitive. And it's come about because there's talk at the moment about property prices starting to fall. But there's also talk at the moment about property prices starting to rise. So if you like go and look on Google News for stories about property prices, you'll see on any given day people saying that they're the highest ever and people saying that they're plummeting. 
And with it being the summer, it's that funny time of year when there's always a slowdown. It's like, well, is this the normal slowdown or is this more of a slowdown? But anyway, there have been lots of stories about how prices in London have started to fall. And so the story I've found is actually an opinion piece on Forbes.com. And it's someone talking about how when property prices fall, they tend not just to drift gradually downwards, they tend to really plummet. So with property, the prices are very volatile. They'll shoot up and they'll plummet back down and you just won't have sort of the nice, even steady trends that you might want for something which is so important as people's houses. And he says that the reason for this is a lack of speculation in the market, which is the exact opposite of what you might think. But he's arguing that the thing is like when people think that things are going to get better, that knowledge is kind of priced into the market. So even if things are really bad right now, you can predict that in a year's time, things are going to be better and you can go out and buy property and that'll push things up. However, there's no way of going short on property in the same way that you do with stocks. When people think things are going to get worse, the only way you can act on that is selling a property you've already got. There's no other way of expressing that. There's no futures market in property. When things do suddenly go bad, no one's had an opportunity to act on that preemptively. So suddenly things will just go overnight and things will drop off a cliff. And if you look at house price graphs from the past, that's exactly what happens. Things sort of go meander their way up and then crash back down. And so he's arguing that the solution to this is an open market. You actually have futures markets and options and so forth that will allow people to go short on property. And he thinks that that will shore things up and prevent us from having these monumental crashes. Fred Harrison, who we've talked about in the context of the 18-year property cycle, would probably argue that that's not the case. And what we actually need is a lot more taxation, regulation, that kind of thing. But I thought it was really interesting to see that this recognised problem, there are two very different solutions for being proposed. Yeah, it's well worth a read this article because it starts off with quite simple stuff, what everyone else is reporting, which is, in this case, was the recent data from Rightmove on asking prices in the UK. But then it went on to deliver so much more and suggestions and so on. So it's a really, really interesting article. It's not just reporting the, the different trends that are happening in the market. What I did find interesting within those trends, Rob, though, and remember everyone, right moves data is based on asking prices, not selling prices. But what I found interesting is when you go to the regionals, you can see Greater London has dropped by 6%, 5.9% to be exact. But the majority of the rest of the UK, especially the further away you go through London, the drops are very modest. You know, West Midlands 0.1, East Midlands 0.6, Northwest 0.7, you know, not much at all, which you could probably argue seasonal. But London at 6%, is that a bit more? We'll see. It's a funny time of year. I've talked about this on Property News Radio at the moment. It's a funny time of year because we don't know yet whether this is seasonal or whether it's a trend. You know, is London dropping off or is this just because everybody goes on holiday? I think the real interesting data is going to come in a couple of months' time you know, when we go into autumn and we'll see you know, exactly what's happening because at that point the market should pick up again. So we'll see. It's, it's going to be an interesting few months. I don't think anyone needs to panic. I mean, I had somebody say to me, oh, I've been advised that I should wait three months because the market's going to drop. That is just bad advice. Don't assume the market's going to go up. Don't assume it's going to go down when you're making your buying decisions. Look to the long term, look to the medium term, but short term, don't try and catch a falling knife or a rising balloon, but they're quite slow, aren't they, Rob? But you get my point. The point is, you can't make buying decisions, investment decisions on very short term trends. Look to the medium, look to the long term, but don't base it on short term. I wouldn't worry too much about this data, but I think it's going to be an interesting time in a few months' time to see which way it actually goes. Yeah, it will be. And it'll be interesting to see if any of the various suggestions to reduce volatility in the market are going to be acted upon in any way, or if a volatile market is something we're stuck with. And I think we all quite enjoy it, really, don't don't we? Like, What, what would we talk about if property prices weren't always going up and down? Oh, we'd be doomed. <laughs> we <heard. laughs> Episode 77, what we had for breakfast today. There'd be, no, there'd be nothing else to talk about. But there's plenty to talk about today. So let's get moving on to our topic of the week, which this week is how to flip a property. Now, this is based on a course that we've got within the Property Hub because we are not experts on this subject. And so as we do, when there is a subject that we're not experts on, we found an expert to come and help us. And in this case, it was Susanna Cole from The Good Property Company, who has done hundreds of millions of pounds worth of deals and really, really knows her stuff. And so the course is an hour long and we don't have that long. So this is just going to be a summary. But flipping is an area that can be very profitable. It can also be very risky. And it's, as a result, something that's intimidating to a lot of people. 
So hopefully, if it's something that you're considering, we'll give you a bit of information that will help give you some places to go and research it further and decide whether or not it's for you. So let's start out with why you might want to flip a property in the first place. And we should probably explain, if you don't know, flipping a property is just buying it with the aim of selling it on again as quickly as you possible. So rather than buying and holding and collecting the rental income, which is what we talk about pretty much all the time, in this case, it's a short-term thing. So you're trying to buy something cheap, normally add value in some way and sell it on for a profit. So why would you want to do that? First of all, the obvious one is to make money. And specifically, a lot of people will flip properties in order to increase the amount of capital they've got available to invest. So if you don't have a lot in the way of investable funds, obviously you want to be reusing that capital. So one way of doing that is to buy somewhere, add value in excess of the money you spend on it. Then six months later, you've got more money in your bank account than when you started. And eventually, when you've built up your capital pot, you could then use that for more long-term investments like normal buying and holding. Also, flipping is good for people who want an income now rather than later. So we always talk about how important it is that your property portfolio makes money every month. You don't want to be holding properties where you're speculating on capital gains and you're actually losing money on them every month. You need to be making money, but the amounts of money you make each month are generally going to be modest unless you're dealing with HMOs. So you're going to be making your money over the long term rather than immediately. If you actually want to have an income now, then flipping is one way of using property to achieve that. And also, you can flip properties just to avoid tenants. Some people just do not like having tenants. I do not personally understand this because even if you don't want to self-manage, you can find an agent to look after it for you. It's really not a big deal. But some people just have an aversion to it. So they want to make money from property in a more short-term way without having to worry about all the things that go along with being a landlord. So that's a few reasons why you might want to buy property to sell in the first place. Okay, so lots of reasons why. And it all sounds good, but how do you find these deals? Well, quite simple, sort of. Let's run through it. So first off, estate agents. Now, when we say estate agents, we don't mean just walking past the window, randomly picking something, buying it and walking out. It's just like the below market value course that we talked about. There are ways of going about it. And estate agents is one of the ways you can do this. But you have to build the relationship. So I know Susanna has built great relationships with the estate agents in her area. Yes, this is something that will take time. But if this is the strategy you want to employ, then it's going to be worth that time because otherwise the deals aren't going to come to you. So working with your local estate agents, building on those relationships, letting them know you're serious is a way of doing that. Auctions is another way. But not just during the auction, which is the obvious one, but actually you can get deals before the auction day because the catalog comes out a good few weeks before and people will put offers in to try and take them off the market. So there's an opportunity there to snap something up without the competition. It's actually done quite a lot and something I've, you know, I've done at RMP as well. It's not something you should rush into. The amount of research and due diligence you should do should be there as you would during a normal auction. But if you can get good at doing your research, have a good solicitor in place to check through the legal pack at a reasonable pace, you can do a viewing to make sure everything's okay. Then auctions before are great. And then also after. Now, just because a property hasn't sold doesn't mean it's, an, it's a dud. There are opportunities there to get a property post-auction that hasn't sold for one reason or the other. It might have just been a bad day or a quiet month. And you can go in and put a cheeky offer in and see if you can snap one up post-auction as well. The other option is sources. So people who find below market value property. There's plenty of them out there. Lots of dodgy ones, a few good ones. So make sure you do your research on them as well. But if you can find a good one, they can be very useful too. And then finally... This one's quite time intensive, but it can be very effective. It's going direct to vendors. So go into your market and advertising that you're looking for properties and that you can move quickly. Now, you have to put a good marketing pack together to deliver this. But what you, what you need to do is, in your area, let people know that if they're keen to move quickly, they don't want to bother with estate agents and all the faff of viewings and everything else, you're there to act quickly. There's a lot of people in this market now, and it's getting more competitive. But if you're prepared to put the time and effort in, it can be effective as well. As I said, a lot of those are very, very similar to the the buying below market value philosophy that we've talked about in more detail. So go back and listen to the, the stuff we've done on that or go to the course that's free on the Property Hub if you want more info. But Susanna points out that you should be looking for mid-market properties if you're doing a flip. Normal three-bed houses will be more attractive. 
And that's because they appeal to the largest market, which actually is a little bit different to what we suggest on buy-to-let properties. Buy-to-let properties are one, two-bed flats and small two-bed and three-bed houses. They tend to be the most effective. But in buy-to-sell, three-bed houses are actually the best way to go. Okay, so they are a lot of different ways you can find potential deals. So you have all these deals coming your way. How do you analyze those to find out which is going to make a profitable flip? Well, firstly, the obvious thing is that you need to be able to buy it for a price where you think that you can sell it for more than the price you pay for it, plus the amount that you're going to spend on the refurb. It's often said that you make your money when you buy. And that is true in a lot of things. It's true in this case. But there's another thing as well. You also need to be able to accurately estimate and control your costs. So those two factors... The amount that you buy it for and the amount that you spend are the important things that you have control over. You can start by looking at the end price, like what do you think you can get it for by the time you've done the work and it's in great condition, and then deduct your anticipated spend. And that will tell you how much you can pay to acquire it in the first place. And Susanna says that you should be looking for a 20% profit margin after all costs. What that means is like making 20% profit would be absolutely great. But it also means that if things go wrong in some way, which they always will to some extent, there will be a bit of a margin for error in there. So you can still make a profit or at least not lose money, even if things go really wrong. So for example, say in the course of the refurb, you discover that there are some structural works that need doing that you hadn't anticipated. And it's going to cost you an extra £5,000 or something. Or say that you've been optimistic about the end price that you can achieve, or even that the market has slowed down a bit while in the process of doing it, because it can take months to do the refurb. In that case, if you've got a 20% profit margin, then you're still going to be safe. You'll still be able to make some money or at least not lose money. So important to have that margin. Also, Susanna says, it's important to make sure that it stacks up as a rental in case it doesn't sell. Because we're going to talk about risks later, but one of the risks, of course, is that you can't actually sell it. And in that case, you want to make sure that you're happy holding it. And it's often said that you should buy a house as if you're happy to keep it forever. And in this case, it's the same thing. You might only want to hold it for six months, but you know, you might not be able to hold it in that time frame. So make sure that you're actually getting the rental yield that you'd be happy with as well. So those are all things to look at. The main, main ones being make sure that you've got the profit margin in there and make sure that it works as a rental as well. And also, as Rob said, make sure that it's something that appeals to a large target market because you don't want to be having a really niche property with some kind of factor that puts people off when you're trying to sell it as quickly as possible. You really want it to appeal to as many people as possible. So they're all things to look at, as well, of course, as all the normal things that you'd look at when buying any property. So really, it's all the work you'd normally do and a little bit more as well. Okay, so let's look at financing a deal now. Now, typically, you think buy to let, you think mortgage, and and quite right. But when you're doing buy to sell, you should avoid mortgages. Mortgages aren't intended as short-term products. So lenders could blacklist you if they notice what you're doing, if you're constantly flipping properties and using mortgages to do that. So the way to go is either bridging finance or cash. So bridging finance, if you're not aware of it, what happens is they lend you money. It, it, It tends to be a fairly high rate, maybe a percent or more a month. But... It's only intended for the short term, which makes it ideal if you're doing buy to sell, if you only need financing for, say, three to six months. Bridging is a way of doing it. It's like a mortgage. You know, you'll put a percentage of down, maybe 30, 40 percent, depending on different factors. The rest is financed by the bridging company who will charge you, you know, around, let's most commonly, I'd say around about a percent a month. And then you'll do your your refurb, and then you'll end your bridging finance once you're done, once you exit that buy to sell. The simple way, of course, is cash. Not everybody can do it cash. Not everyone has enough cash lying around to do that. But if you have, then cash is a really good way of going about it. But if you don't have the cash, a potential option is doing a joint venture with somebody who has cash. Now, joint ventures get mentioned a lot, and I think people sometimes make it sound easier than it seems because, oh, I'm going to look for somebody to do a joint venture with. What, well, what's your track record? Oh, I haven't got one. Oh, I don't know about you, Rob, but I wouldn't put my money with someone with zero track record. So maybe if you've done a few yourself, then maybe you can approach people who 
might be interested in doing a joint venture with you because people with money probably want to see a track record of success before they're going to hand over their cash. You know, they want to give it to experts, not people who are experimenting and learning their way. Now, if using bridging, you must remember to factor it into your costs because bridging can be expensive. So when you're doing your projections, your cash flows, make sure you include it. And and give it a few months overrun as well, because sometimes projects do take longer than than you anticipated. You know, many refurbs projects do, especially if you're new to it. So make sure you add a few months on for bridging costs, just in case it takes a little longer than you anticipated. Yeah, so the finance is one aspect that I think intimidates a lot of people when it comes to buying to sell. Because with mortgages, you kind of know where you stand. It's all fairly simple, and you know it's for the long term. With bridging, it's more expensive. There are entry fees, exit fees, it can all start adding up and it's all quite intimidating. Financing is one thing that puts people off flipping a lot of the time. Another is the actual refurb itself. Because this is something where if you don't have relevant experience, it's something that can be really scary. And of course, you can get it very wrong. And if you do get it wrong, that can be expensive and it can eat up all your potential profit and more. Because for me, when I walk into a house, I can tell if work needs doing to it, but I have no idea how much work because I don't know if it's just something on the surface or if it's something fundamentally wrong. And I have no idea how much it's going to cost to put it right. I know some people who can just walk in and it's just like they've got a mental spreadsheet or something and they can just go, oh, yep, that wall needs to come down. That needs to happen. That needs to happen. And they'll just be able to sort of estimate it to seemingly within a few pounds just by having a quick look. If you can't do that, which most of us can't, then you need to get builders in, preferably before you buy it, to tell you how much you're looking at. So you want to find a building firm that you trust, but before you get to that point, get three quotes. And in fact, I think she says always get three quotes because you never know if you're working with someone all the time, they might get complacent and start edging the costs up a little bit. When it comes to the refurb, when you found someone to do it for you, management and timing is everything. So again, on the first one, it's difficult because you need to have materials arriving at the right time. You need to have a certain phase of the job done before someone else can do their bit. And it's the kind of thing where if you're not managing it effectively, then it can overrun by weeks just because everyone's sitting around waiting for someone else to do their bit, waiting to be told what to do. So it is a difficult thing to do. Susanna actually recommends that on your first one, you do everything yourself. And I was surprised by this. I thought she was going to say, for your first one, employ a project manager, learn from them how to do it. But she says, no, throw yourself in the deep end and just figure it out. Because once you've done it once and you've been forced every day to learn about 10 new things, then it's going to be a lot easier next time. You can decide to agree with that or disagree. But either way, the management of of the refurb is really, really important. When you are doing that refurb, amazingly, people still make the classic property ladder mistake of doing really bonkers things <laughs> with the decor. It's really important to keep it neutral. And it's amazing that you still need to say this, but apparently it's still the biggest mistake that people make is putting in the kind of the furnishings and the look that they would want. And that is not what you want to do. Again, because you want to sell quickly, That means that you want to sell to the largest possible number of people. And that means you've just got to keep it neutral. Go for something that no one's going to object to so that they can come in, they can see themselves living there, and they can imagine how to put their own spin on it. Another thing to keep in mind for the refurb is not to spend money unnecessarily. And often these two things are tied in. Often people end up spending way too much money because they make a property as they would want to live in it. And as a result, they spend a fortune on everything down to the taps and they'll just spend spend an absolute fortune on things and chances are the target market doesn't care or actively doesn't like it and have to change it all anyway only spend money where it matters to the target market so the thing to do there is to actually try and get an estate agent in while the process is still going on and ask them what the target market cares about This is everything from the layout, find out if they like open plan or if they want a separate sitting room or something, all the way down to what kind of fixtures matter. As a general rule, don't spend money unnecessarily. You might think that you need to spend a fortune on on all kinds of different things, but really it's not. You just need something to look bright, clean, modern and neutral. Then people will be able to walk in and put their own spin on things. And if they want to change the taps later, they can do. So the two things with a refurb where costs really get out of hand are actually spending more money than you need to on the actual fixtures and having time overrun. So you need to keep a tight rein on both of those things. 
I love the advice where Susanna says, do your first management project yourself because the real learning is in doing and I think that's great advice. So although it might seem quite intimidating to manage your own first project and you probably won't make as much money as you should and it'll probably take a bit longer than it should, if you're serious about this and you want to do this again and again and again, then accept that it's not going to be the perfect first deal and learn because the learning will then make you so much more profitable in future deals. You know, it might not be for everyone, but if you're going to do it, you know, as Rob said, you can agree or disagree with, with Susanna and her advice there. I, I agree. And I know you do, Rob. But if you do go that way, I think it's a really, really effective way of accelerating your knowledge. Okay, so buy to sell. As in the name, most people think of the refurb, but as in the name suggests, there's, there's a really important part of this, and it's the selling. And sometimes I feel people probably overlook this part. They just go, oh, refurb's done, it's popular on the market, let's collect the cash. But actually, there's still work to be done at this point. And Susanna is very, very good at doing this, the selling part. She presents the properties that she's selling really, really well. She'll actually move in furniture and dress the property so people can see themselves living there. It allows them to make decisions very, very quickly. Because remember, this is very different to buy to let. With buy to sell, people buy properties purely on emotion. Can they see themselves living there? We'll aid them with this process and dress the properties accordingly. Once you've bought a furniture pack to dress a property... You can put it into storage and then next time around, do it again. You don't leave all the furniture in there. So don't think, oh, I've got to buy furniture every single time. As I say, the first deal might not be a big profit maker. But once you've bought it, you can just move it around every property you do from then on. So presenting the property is a big, big part. And I think that's something Susanna does very, very well. Keeping on top of the agent is something I know she does well too. She goes and visits her local agent every single week. They know that she's going to be turning up every week. So they know they better have done something since the week before so keeping on top of the agent is a really good way of making sure that your property is certainly front of mind with them and that they're pushing it for you as hard as at least any other property now you may not want to go and visit your estate agent every week but a call might be enough you know speaking to them and letting them know that you're interested in what's happening and that you're not going to go away quickly that extra incentive i'm sure can only help And finally, it sounds obvious, but again, I think it's a mistake people make, is don't be greedy. People can get emotional with their refurbs as they do with selling their own homes. Oh, it's worth so much more than this because people don't care about your blood, sweat and tears that have gone into making this property. They care about the property they're buying and the price it's at. They don't really think it should be priced 10 grand over because, you know, you had to work weekends and nights for six weeks to get it up to scratch that's not that's not their prerogative they want a property that they like and a good price so don't be greedy don't be over ambitious with your price because remember if it takes an extra two months to sell that's an extra two months of expensive finance that you've had to pay out for don't be greedy be realistic and speak to your agent to say you know if i want this sold within six weeks what it need to go onto the market for yeah exactly so What Susanna says in conclusion is that really you're buying wholesale and selling retail. So what you want to do is get a property at a really great price because not many other people are competing with you for it. It's too much work for most people. An owner-occupier would never be interested. So you're buying wholesale, then you're adding value and you're presenting it in a really beautiful way. So you can then go on to sell it for top dollar. So it makes a lot of sense. You buy it at a good price, you control your costs, and by actually putting in the features that people care about, you make it appealing to the target market, and you present it beautifully, then that means you can get it sold quickly and for the best possible price. And Susanna often has properties selling at the price she wants or above within a couple of days. And that's because she's put the work into the presentation. So it's a property that would have appealed to a large number of people in the first place. That's really important but also the presentation. So it's putting in the furniture pack like Rob talked about. It's also about the photos. The photos that she takes are like the kind of thing that you'd see in a lifestyle magazine. And that means what when people are going through right move or whatever, that's going to stand out an absolute mile. She also insists on writing all the property descriptions herself because, you know, it makes sense. Having put all this time and effort and money into something, you don't want to just like let your agent write the same old normal rubbish like, you know, it's got walls, there are rooms, whatever they normally say. Taking a bit of time to really make people imagine like they're living there will make all the difference of getting people through the door in the first place. And the more people you get through the door, the more potential you've got for a bidding war, which is what you want. 
it, 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 well, I was going to say it sounds easy. I don't know if it does sound easy, but the whole process, you can, you can talk about it quite quickly. The essence of it is quite simple. It's very simple. You just need to make sure that you're buying something and adding value to it and then selling it on for more than it costs you to do that. But it is really hard work and it is a huge learning curve. And the profit that you make is a reward for your effort. So you can't forget to factor in your time and your stress when you're doing a project like this. It's so common for people to spend all their evenings and weekends for months doing all the work themselves and going, brilliant, I made £10,000. But if they worked out their hourly rate on that, it would have been so much better if they'd just done some overtime at work or got a part-time job at McDonald's or something. So you've got to factor in your time and the stress. And as we said earlier, you've got to make sure that there's a healthy margin in it. So even if everything goes wrong, you'll still do okay. And if you do take Susanna's advice and on the first one, project manage everything yourself, you're going to learn so much. You might not make as much money as you would have done, but you're going to learn a huge amount, which is valuable in itself. And that means that you're going to do even better next time. Yes. Yeah, so buying to sell, it can be a super effective strategy. For people who want to put the time in, and you know, Susanna is very clear about that. It's not something you can do passively. You sit at home in in London, maybe, and have a buy to sell operating, you know, miles away. It's not something you can, unless you're working with someone to do that for you. It's not something you can really do without putting the time and effort in. So your reward, as Rob and Susanna have quite rightly said, is reflected in the profit you make. The more effort you put in the better chance of you making a profit. But then don't overdo it, put too much effort in, and your pounds per hour, you could have worked in a, in a bar collecting glasses and, and, and more. So you've got to be careful. Um, it's like buy to let. It sounds easy, doesn't it? Buy below market value and you know get a good get a good return. Simples. Uh, the, you know, As we've explained, there is work and effort that goes into it, just as there is with buy to sell. So make sure you accept everything that needs to be done to achieve the end result. Because like with any property strategy, this doesn't relate to buy to sell. What people do is they look at the end result and go, I want that. And they kind of blur what they have to do before conveniently in their own minds because they just think, oh, that end goal is so exciting that I'll go for it. And then when they're you know working nights and weekends, taking off wallpaper from a wall, you know the glamour's gone a bit. So make sure it's right for you. You know yourself best. Are you the type of person that's going to be you know prepared to put the effort in working? Or are you the type of person who wants something a bit more passive and something that's running in the background? Only you can decide that. But this has been a really good episode, not just hopefully for you, but for for Rob and I ourselves, because we don't operate this strategy because we like to be passive. But it's been really good learning from what Susanna's talked about. And the courses she's put together is absolutely great too. And the courses she delivers are absolutely fantastic by reputation. So thank you, Susanna, for, for helping us put this episode together. Okay, so resource of the week, Rob. You've picked this one out. It's something I use too. Uh, and I've started to use, and we kind of flip around <laughs> with the stuff we use to to manage things like this. But I actually got this one from Pete Matthew. He doesn't know this, but he used it, and I was like, "Oh, I'll have a bit of that." I'd read a blog earlier that day about this piece of software, and then I received an email from him using this this exact software. So it made it then pushed me to go and have a look a bit further, and I've used it since. So I built it up. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> right, it's called Assistant dot. Two. The idea is that you put your own name at the end, so you get like assistant.2 slash Rob. And this is a plugin for Gmail. So if you use Gmail, we've had a few resources in the past which allow you to do cool things by adding onto that platform. And this one is for scheduling, which is always a pain point. And we've talked about um, You Can Book Me in the past, which is something else that we use and I still use. But this is just a really lightweight and easy way of scheduling an appointment with someone. So what you do is when you're writing an email, you're kind of, you get to that point where you're just like, oh, okay, let's meet up. I can do next Thursday at t- after two, or I can do Wednesday, but I can only really do the morning. And it just gets so confusing. It's really hard for you and for the other person to reply to. With assistant.2, what you do is you click a button and it brings up your calendar. So it integrates with your Google calendar. All you do is you drag to select the blocks of time when you're available to meet. So you just click and drag. And then assistant.2 puts all those times into the email for you. Then when it gets sent to your recipient, all they have to do is click on the time that works for them. And that's it. It blocks it out in your calendar. It sends them an invite as well. And the whole thing's scheduled. It's that easy. I've just started using it this week and it's already 
just been a revelation. Because with You Can Book Me, which we've talked about before, you can do something similar, but it's a bit more heavyweight and it involves the, the person going away and like sort of clicking through this like four step process or something. And sometimes you just don't need that. You just want to set up a time to meet someone and you want to do it from within the email where you are anyway. So that's what I love about it. It saves time for both people and it's really, really quick. So I've already set up a few meetings this way and it's just brilliant because I can just go in and rather than having to describe the times that I'm free, it will just put them all in for me. And all the person has to do is click. So if you ever have annoying back and forth with trying to schedule times with people, which I'm sure you will because... We're all busy people and trying to find a time when our diaries can coordinate is just a nightmare. Assistant.2, I think you'll find a really easy way of doing it if you're a Gmail user. Indeed. I use it. Rob uses it. Check it out. It's free. It's well worth a look. It's really, really simple to use. And I think that's why it's so effective. So have a look. We'll link to it in the show notes, which you can find at thepropertyhub.net forward slash flip. Okay, Rob. So talking about flip, we flipped around the structure of our podcast. Good link. See what I did there? <laughs> yeah. Um, iTunes reviews now. And thank you to everyone who continues to leave them. We'll talk about what's coming up next week shortly. But before that, iTunes reviews. Now, Rob, we have been shown the love by so many people and their reviews. And thank you to everyone who has left us such positive reviews. But wait there, Rob. Dun, dun, dun. We've got our first negative review. No. Yeah. It seems... <laughs> it's Stevie is a little unhappy. He's left his five stars still. Shall we point out before getting into it that this is this is not why we've moved the iTunes reviews to the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> We're not hoping that you've yeah. stopped listening. Not trying to trick you, but um, it's just a, uh, we've had a few people say before they want us to get to the meat of the episode more quickly. So this is a way that we can do that. We can get straight into it. And then if you're interested, you can stick around for the reviews. If you're not, you can stop listening. So do stop listening now if you want to. It seems like we've picked a good week to start doing this. There's no way people are going to stop listening. Everyone loves a bit of drama. <laughs> okay, so Stevie says, I listened to every episode of this and have previously given it five star. But sorry, guys, you really need to stop plugging your own stuff. You know your industry, and as an avid listener, appreciate good content. But, wait for it, Rob. Two books, that's your fault. A website, that, that's us, that's both of us. RMP, that, that's me. Yeah, a Latin agent, that, that, that's us. Now a, a new book, that, that's us. So, um, we are clearly doing too much for Stevie. So, we apologise, Stevie. But, I, I think we should be allowed... If we read out negative reviews, Rob, oh, and he says, don't ruin something that's been great. I think if we read them out, we should be, if we can, be allowed to defend ourselves. So if, how about I defend you? So the two books that you've written. Now, I, <laughs> I'm sure they're books to help people. Um, I'm pretty sure. Um, I have read them, and that's what I got from it. And I know you haven't bought Necker Island 2 off the back of them yet because they're not priced at £100 each. So I think, you know, putting books out to help people learn is, is no bad thing. And if we joint defend the website that's free for everyone to access and use and um, the property hub, um, then I think we should be allowed to get away with that one. RMP, yes, that is a company too, but we give away all the knowledge free up front and then people can choose to work with us. And again, that helps people build the portfolio. But I'll let you take over Yellow Rob at a new book. Yeah, well, I think that the new book is something which is going to cost a couple of pounds if that. And, Rob, um, you capitalist pig. <laughs> but there will be a period where it's free, which we'll be telling you about, of course. And again, that's something that we spent a lot of time collating and all the information is going to be incredibly useful. And Yellow, it's like, well, yeah, of course, we need it to make money for it to exist. All companies need to make a profit, but it's something where we're hoping it's going to offer a, re a really great service. It's going to be very useful to a lot, a lot of people. And if it's not, you can just choose not to use it. What we try to do and what we need to make very sure that we do is that we don't push anything down anyone's throat. So m the m vast, vast majority of what we do is completely free. That's how I think things should be. But where there is something where you can choose to pay, it's a choice. And we never want to be forcing that on, a, on anyone. It's there if you want it. And if you don't, then just ignore it or fast forward through that section. It's absolutely fine. And it's funny how like when you attach a price to things, things get a bit weird. So we had the free meetup, which would have happened yesterday. And we talked about that a lot, but because it's free, it, people don't really have a problem with it. But that's something where we, we spent a lot, a lot of time and our money putting that on for people so they could, they could have a good experience. And if it had co cost a fiver, then people might have sort of felt funny about that as well. It's a really weird thing. 
I don't really know what the answer to it is, but I think that we're not going to stop doing things that we think are really useful. We need to make sure, of course, that we're not forcing them on, on anyone, which I don't think we are. But we do, of course, take criticism on board as well. We, and an example of that is, is moving the reviews to the end because a few people said they just wanted to get into the episode more quickly. So we do listen. So do, do let us know what, what you think and we will, we will continue to act on it and we'll continue to read out comments, good and bad. But hopefully we'll have a lot more good still to come. So the reviews will always be here as part of the show. Do please leave us a review if you enjoy the show because we love reading them out. We do. And don't worry, Stevie, next week we've got a big announcement, but it's a freebie. There's loads of stuff we're giving away free next week. So listen out for that one, because I know everyone loves a freebie. So don't worry, we'll, we're going to be giving a lot away free next week, which leads us into next week. And next week, Rob, again, this is what someone has asked us to cover this one. It's the best websites or our list of top property websites. Now, we put a, a, a post in the propertyhub.net. Don't worry, Stevie, it's free. Um, and you can <laughs> you can make suggestions there of the, of the websites you'd like us to cover. Now, bear in mind, if you're listening to this any later than Thursday, then we record this on Friday. So if you listen to this the day of launch and you want to suggest your website that you think should be covered in the episode, feel free to add that in if you listen to this on the Thursday. But if not, don't worry. We've got plenty of ideas and suggestions ready for you next week. And as I said, we're going to be making a huge announcement. We're, we're basically giving it all away free. That'll make more sense next week. We announced it at the meetup. So if you're at the meetup, you know what we're talking about. But if you weren't, listen in because you'll find out. Yes, you will. So thank you so much for listening. Get over to the show notes at thepropertyhub.net slash flip. You'll find links to everything that we talked about in this episode. And you'll find an, a nice easy link where you can either leave us a review on iTunes, which we would love, or you can send us a voicemail and get your voice on the show, which we would also love. But thank you so much for listening. We'll see you again next week. But for now, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Property Podcast. Make sure you join our mailing list at thepropertypodcast.com. And remember, we love five-star reviews. Rob even loves them more than air miles. Yeah.